get to the message right away because I want to continue on speaking about dealing with our memories and uh, bringing some healing there. So we'll, we'll do more of it next week. But in, in line with what we were talking about earlier, it's, uh, it's always a, a hard and a humbling thing. And, and I've learned over the years that, you know, it, it's so much easier to humble yourself to the Lord than constantly trying to power through and just figure it out. Because sometimes our endurance, and we're taught as Christians to endure, but sometimes endurance is just dumb right? Because there's no sense if you're just doing the wrong stuff to just keep enduring. Going, Lord, I'm just going to endure. And he's like, I wish you wouldn't. <laughs> I wish you would really give up what you're doing. And so, so sometimes we can endure for endurance sake because we're just too proud to lay it down. We're just too proud to ask some tough questions. And so one of the things I was doing, and I, I want to put some, a little bit of vision in front of you guys before I get into the message. But so I was, I was, <laughs> I was laying in bed last night and I'm just like, the cloud was thick I could cut it with a knife and and uh, I just feeling very discouraged and and Victoria's good in the morning she's like hey fierce leader what's gonna be the powerful encouraging message this morning and I'm trying to have a shower I'm just like hit the road there's <laughs> you'll be lucky if I come um like maybe you'll be preaching this morning but anyway so last night I was I, I was <laughs> I you know you're getting desperate when I'm on websites going you know reading stuff eight signs your church is in trouble <laughs> and <laughs> your pastor doesn't want to do it anymore that's that's uh, was at the top of the list um no 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 really so actually we're, we were in good shape according to that list but one of the things that really jumped out and impacted me and it kind of ran me over. Um, and, and in that moment, I, you, it's funny how the soul and the mind works. I was immediately trying to justify and go, well, well, you know, there's reasons and stuff. But, but one of the ones was this, and it said, one of the ways you know your church is in trouble is if everybody in your church drives to the community where you're having church and nobody from that community is going to your church. I'm like, that's been every church we've done. Every community we've been in, people from outside the community have come. Now that's good. That's good if you're going to come into a community to plant a church to reach the community. But if you never actually reach the community and just become ingrown and, and, and complain if the donuts aren't nice or what, whatever we're complaining about. Um, and I'm not saying, or the coffee's not ready, right? It, you know, we, we, we start to focus on the wrong stuff, right? We, and, and in fact, we stop being kingdom. So, so that was a revelation. And then another revelation that hit me this week. So it was a tough week because God was dealing with some other things. I was listening to Brian Zond, who I love, and he's got a big church in the States, and he's one of the front runners of progressive Christianity and the gospel of grace, and just, he's, he's just a brilliant man. He's just, there's genius, and then there's Brian Zond, and, and, and there's others like him. Brad Jerzak's another one, but, but they're, they're both in the same category, really. And so I was listening to his book called, um, on audio tape, because I had <laughs> reading is like just, uh, you know, I like to read on my phone digital or I listen, like to listen to it. I, paper is frustrating, you know, my thumbs get sore. I don't know, it's a <laughs> bad excuse, you know. But um, anyway, so I, I'm listening to his book and, and you know, it's really interesting. And, and, and for those of you who have been with me for a while, you know, but I'm still transitioning out of this stuff that he said that the problem is that as people, we, we love to scapegoat the the other group right we we get in a crowd mentality and all the horrible violent acts that have happened in humanity have have happened because of the crowd you know nazi germany um and there's all all sorts of examples of when the crowd gets together bad things happen you know like crucify him burn the witch you know it's always the crowd crying out for justice yeah, and so they want, they want violence, they want wrath, you know, and, and so there's all sorts of studies done on this that what an individual will do by themselves, it, it doesn't, 
they, they wouldn't do the same evil that when they find themselves in a group, a group mentality can kind of stir them to do things. And we see these in all sorts of cases where, where women have been attacked by groups um, where those individual men wouldn't have done that act by themselves, but when then they get in a group, then all sorts of atrocities happen. So without getting in a big discussion about scapegoating and, uh, scapegoating and mimetic theory, and we'll talk about that sometime, um, there's just the power of the crowd. And so what what happens is that often minorities are the ones that get segregated or get pushed out or get attacked because we're looking for someone to blame. So in this whole transition, as we are, and, and this is part of what a church is, is called out ones. And, and then it's an extraordinary experience when you're being called out from the church, right? The church is the called ones, and then God's calling us out of kind of evangelicalism and calling us out of mainstream Christianity to say, hey, we need to look at some things. We've kind of been preaching a violent message because it's very tribal. It's us versus them. It's the Christians versus the world. It's the saints versus the sinners. It's the righteous versus the pagans. And, and that motif has been all throughout Christendom. And, and it got way worse after Constantine, way worse, because then the church became militarized, right? We started taking up swords and banners, and we used the cross as a logo instead of a means of laying down life, right? And, in, and the history is evidence. We have crusades where we did horrible things, where we slaughtered millions of Muslims, and they killed us, and that battle is still going on today. Some of that bitterness still exists in those parts of the world against Christians because we killed so many of them in the name of Jesus, right? And it's amazing that we thought that way. But I spent a lot of time uh, actually doing research, watching, and I, this might sound funny, but I like watching period films on Netflix. Like I'm watching one right now called The Last Kingdom. And, and it's all about the, when England was becoming a nation and they kind of got surrounded by the Danes and the Danes were taking over the British Isles and pushed them all the way to Wessex. And that's where they kind of make their final stand to start to push back to become England. But, and at that time, it's all about Christianity. And you have these priests saying, our God's better than your God, and our God's right, and your God's wrong, and he will save us, and he didn't, right? I mean, these priests were getting shot through with arrows, and, and the Danes would make fun of them and say, well, where's your God? If your God's almighty, I'm gonna stand here in your church and mock your God. And, and he said to the priest, let's see how powerful your God is, because you're appealing to this saint who God saved his life. So he, he was shot through with arrows. So they strip the guy down, and he gets all his archers in the room, and they go, priest, cry out to your God, and they let go of the arrows, and he dies. But what the Lord was showing me through that is that Whenever the church has taken a stand for military, like our, we've become our own kingdom, and it's not been a kingdom of righteousness, it starts to become tribal. Well, we're going to fight you, and our God's better than you, and so we're going to kill you by the sword. And so just like Jesus said, those who live by the sword also die by the sword. Because the way of Jesus, as Brian Zahn says, isn't about donkeys and elephants, it's about a lamb. It's a very different kingdom. It's not Democrat or Republican. The kingdom of God is about a lamb, that lamb Jesus, right? That, that is what the kingdom of God is about. So what the Lord was showing me is that the struggle becomes that when you start to get called out to be a, a light in the world, what I did is exactly what I'm preaching, is then I start to scapegoat and villainize the evangelical church. And he said, whenever you do that, you participate in the spirit of Antichrist. So even though we've got the right message now, it feels, then it's like, we're right, you're wrong. And, and we start focusing on the wrongness. And then we try to create the crowd to get all mad about preach, people preaching hellfire and brimstone and how right we are and how wrong they are. And again, the Lord's like, you cannot participate. All this is spirit of Antichrist. You can preach the truth, but you've got to stop going after other groups and just be a light and love and realize that you came out of that and and, and, and they're trying to serve me the best they know how. They're trying to be Christians and they're just clouded. They're just dark in their thinking. But instead of villainizing that group, which I have done at nauseum, right? And, and lots of people have said that to me. 
And I've always justified it by saying, yes, but you gotta, we got to call out what's true and speak against what's false. And that's true. Jesus did do those things. And he wasn't always nice to the Pharisees. So there is a point in saying this is right and this is wrong. But so much change is happening. The Lord's saying, you just need to come now and just preach grace and just be about truth and life and not worry about what the other side's doing because you're not doing what they're doing. Victoria and I have this conversation sometimes because lots of Sundays when I have off, I will confess to you, that I drive around to other churches and look at their parking lots going, ah, good, they've stopped growing, they're losing people, praise God, right? The, the lies are failing and truth is rising. And, and I do that, that's not good. And I know it's not good when I'm doing it, but I got my worship music on, so it's, it's, it's okay. I try to balance it out, you know. So it's like, but, but again, what the Lord was speaking to me, he said, you know, the, the guy who opens up a great steak restaurant isn't driving around to see if people are sitting out fried at McDonald's because that's not what he's doing. He's, he's not making cheap hamburgers. He's making $30 steaks. He's aging his steak for 35 days. He, he has a whole different plan. He's looking for a whole different uh, sector of people. He, he's not trying to sell hamburgers that are half hamburger and half God knows what else for 99 cents. That's not what he's trying to do. As the Lord says, stop, stop comparing yourself to what you're not doing. It's not your demographic. It's not what you're going after. It's not what you're trying to accomplish. So there's been so much change in a very short amount of time. I'm like, oh Lord, you're like turning me inside out again. And, uh, and, and so that's never fun. But as that process is going, I started to think about the community and, and this church. And when you start getting your focus off, I've always wanted to be a city church. But in, in part, you can't decide, and I, I was saying this to Tanya at the break, I said, in my business, I can't wake up one day and go, I'm going to be a billion-dollar business. Uh, you have to start doing something. You have to start selling somewhere at some point, and you've got to learn to walk a little bit before you run. And so my heart, my vision has always been a city for the, like being a church for the city of Calgary, where people came from everywhere and then went back to their communities. But but I'm learning that the Lord's saying, you know, first you have to be a community church before you can be a city church. I mean, how can I give you the city if you can't take care of a community? It can't just be about putting a sign up and hoping they'll come. People hate church. They're not going to come because we put up a sign. And I don't know why I've thought that for so long, but <laughs> the Lord was saying, hey, Dodo, they're not coming. The, you, the whole message that you preach is that people have been burnt out by religion. So why would they come? Because you can't put the message of grace on a sign. It's too big right? So you can't do it. So you have to show grace. You have to be a minister of the people. So do what you love to do. And the things that Victoria and I love to do is we love to throw parties. We love to ha be hosts and have lots of food and invite people over. So last night in the middle of the discouragement and the darkness, I felt the Lord just kind of pressing on my heart. And I just kind of want to put it out to you guys to start thinking about because we have lots of time. But I, I booked the hall uh, December, I think it's 16th is a Sunday, kind of right before Christmas, to do a Christmas banquet for our church, because I thought that would be nice. But as the Lord was kind of dealing with me last night, I thought, why don't we use that as an outreach? Rather than just doing it for ourselves and picking our favorite food and just talking about our church, why don't we invite the community to come and eat a meal for free? Why don't we invite them to and put on a Christmas meal? Because a lot of people are in broken families. A lot of people have maybe not had a Christmas turkey dinner for years. You know, maybe they haven't had anything. And I thought, why, why don't we get creative? And, and I, if some of you are interested, we can talk about it later. But I thought, why don't we get creative, decorate this place beautifully, put on some good music, put on, you know, some comedy and, and, and you know, and laugh and, and have some Christmas carols and, 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 and do a meal. And, and maybe I do a little talk about it after and invite people to, to come to our church by giving them a free meal. Instead of going to door and just saying, hey, come to our church. It's a better church than what you're used to, right? Like that, that's hard to do. Why don't we just be a better church than they're used to instead of trying to convince them on a piece of paper, but actually physically invite them and say, we're putting on a free turkey dinner for the community of Ogden. It's the refuge Christmas, you know? And so 
I, I don't know, that just really spoke to me last night about, about how do we reach a community. And I think as a church, we could get excited about that, right? Mm-hmm. Any of you would be excited about kind of doing something like that? I think so. And I think if we got behind that and we invited people, I don't know how many people come, but maybe we get 40 or 50 people and give them a free meal. It's not going to cost us a fortune to do that. We take a risk. And, and instead of just sending out an advertising, because I've been waiting literally for us to have enough money that we could do a direct mail out with invite cards, you know, come to our church because it's so much more awesome than anything you're used to or what, <laughs> however we brand that, right? <laughs> however we brand that. And, and, and I felt, no, nah, there's just something cold about that, right? I think the Lord wants us to, to physically reach people and, and that's gonna maybe require us putting some posters up and going door to door and physically inviting people. We wanna invite you to free meal. That's what we're doing for the community and it's something we could actually do for Ogden, hey? So anyways, I was excited about that, and I, I think it's something we should do, and I think it's something God's calling us to do, and we've never done it before as a church. We've, we've had Christmas banquets, but not for the community. We've just done it for ourselves, right? And that's not very kingdom, I'm starting to figure out. <laughs> so it would be more kingdom to re- reach people. So I believe God's given us an amazing message, and I think it needs to get out to people, and they're not going to come because we put a sign on the ground. We are actually, and you know what? It gives each one of us an opportunity to seek first the kingdom of God, even though you might not be a preacher or a singer or whatever. You, you can come and help. You can help decorate at a Christmas banquet. You can buy a few extra tickets so that we can give them away for free. You can come door to door and hand out flyers. That, that's something most of us can do, and that as a community, we can could really see something because wouldn't it be encouraging if we fed 50 people at something like that and even if none of them come we've planted seeds of just the goodness of Jesus in a community because that's the message we're sending and people will talk about it oh, that church put on a free dinner and it, there wasn't some hard push like now y'all got to get saved you know it's like we can just love them and make them laugh amen, amen. all right so I still got some time for a message okay so if you have Bibles <clears throat> which is you know, good if you go to Ephesians chapter four. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time. Uh, we just ask again that your spirit be in and through us and in our minds to help absolutely help us to understand the fullness of your grace and the fullness of your mercy and the fullness of your heart for for ourselves first, uh, for this church and for the community that we find ourselves in. Bring glory to your name, Jesus. Amen. Um, <clears throat> oh, our churches, churches in general, we're in, we're in such a need of, a, of new Bible translations that are smoother and bring out the heart of God more. So we will go through this passage. It's a little bit rough, um, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guide you through it as we talk about the mind. Um, my experience has been, and Victoria again and I were, were, we were talking about this this morning, but you know, I've, I've walked with the Lord a long time. I've been in ministry for over 30 years. And over that time, you, you learn a lot about people. You learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we, we learned early on that, you know, surrounding people and yelling in tongues and pushing them to the ground with oil on their forehead in the shape of the cross doesn't necessarily make people much better. <laughs> and uh, that was a tough one to learn to give that up because it really seemed that would have a, you know, you know and they just kind of fall over and they're like wiping oil off their head for the next week. Um, that, that wasn't very effective. And what has been much more effective is when you just meet people face to face and you empathize empathize with the suffering and the stuff they've gone through and you talk to them and hear their story and and that has an effect but it also doesn't end there because just having empathy for people and listening to their story doesn't necessarily make them any better I mean there's a lot of people that walk around telling the same story over and over and over again and I don't know if you know people like this but we see people like this all the time in different places that we go where you know we've heard their story and they've told us how hard it's been and what they've been through and and then you walk by and you know a few weeks later you see them standing with someone else telling their story again and how hard it's been and what they've been through and then a couple months later you see that same person standing with a new group of people telling their story and how tough it's been and how hard their life's been and and you can see that their identity becomes what their story is their story becomes their identity they they mark themselves by what they have suffered they become the sufferer right of what they've been through i have suffered it's who i am this is my story you know 
And so the problem is when that is your story, it's hard to live outside the story. It's hard to live it because everything is contextualized by your story. When anything bad happens, you go, well, yeah, bad stuff always happens to me. I just expect it. That's part of my story. You know, oh, that didn't go right for me today. It never goes right for me. That person hurt me. Well, people always hurt me. That's my story. It's what always happens. And we start to look for it. And as you look for it, you actually start to magnetically draw it to you. Because as you look for evil, evil comes your way, you know. It's like people who are always saying, oh, the devil's attacking me, the devil's attacking me. It's funny that the devil's always attacking them because it's always part of their conversation. It's always part of their belief system. They believe that the devil's going to attack them, so he does. They believe they're going to be sick, so they always are. Well, and I hear people say it all the time. Oh, yeah, someone got sick in work. I'll for sure get it because that's what always happens. And I just go, well, for sure you're going to get sick because it's what you believe. And we have no idea the power of our belief. More and more research is happening in this and as they study people's minds and what we think. That you, and this is why athletes practice visualization. They imagine themselves winning. They imagine themselves catching the winning touchdown. They imagine throwing complete passes. If you notice, all my analogies are football. If, if, <laughs> you know, everything that they do is they, they begin to imagine themselves being successful. But for a lot of us, we imagine ourselves failing. We imagine ourselves getting hurt because it's happened. And then we become afraid. And so in order to prepare ourselves for more devastation and more loss, we try to get ready for it. We try to prepare our hearts for loss, and so we shrink back. Now, the problem is, is when you have that mentality, and just take it in business, well, I'm probably not going to make that sale because I never make sales and I never close. It's really hard to go in with confidence when you go to make sale. And people that you're selling to can feel that you feel that. Well, do you want to buy this? No, yeah, okay. <laughs> You, you seem very confident about your product. I'm glad I didn't buy it, right? Or, 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 we, or we try to get aggressive, you know. Are you going to buy this? You know, it's a good product. You should buy it. No, yeah, that's how I figured, you know. <laughs> and we, we try to mask our pain or our disappointment with, with then aggression, and then that doesn't work either. Or we learn the art of being passively aggressive. Are you going to buy this? No? Oh, of course you won't can't make decisions. You're a person who doesn't make decisions well, and that's okay. That's okay. There's lots of people like you. Have a nice day, you know, (laughs) and that's not very effective either. People don't want to buy stuff from you either, right? But people that are confident and believe in what they're doing and believe what they're selling, sell. They sell because people ultimately aren't buying your product. They're buying you. They, they have to like you. And if they like you, I, I know I've met salesmen and I'm bad this way because if I like the person, it doesn't matter what they're selling me, I buy it. I'm like, I don't need a toaster oven. I don't even have where to put it. You know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. But, you know, every time someone comes to the door, I'm like, honey, you better answer the door. We don't have any money right now and I will buy something we don't need, you know. The worst is where I was at the Stampede one year and there was a booth with all these uh, creams and stuff. And this company was from Israel. And I'm walking by. I'm like, oh, I just walk by. And the girl's like, come in, come in. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't eat cream. I don't, I don't ever use cream. I don't even like cream. My wife does, well, it would be a beautiful gift for your wife. And like a zombie, I go, oh, what it? You know, and I, and I get sucked in. And they are like talking numbers and adding creams and they're supposedly giving me all this stuff for free, which cost me hundreds of dollars <laughs> on cream. And I just walked out of there with bags of cream <laughs> thinking I was getting free stuff. And I'm like sweating. I'm so anxious. I'm like, I can't believe I spent all this money on a bunch of crap I don't want. Two years later, I still got this sea salt exfoliator <laughs> in the cupboard <laughs> but it's awesome. I just <laughs> I never use it, you know? And so I, I, we go back to the staff meeting. And I said to Victor, okay, you take this back and tell those ladies we don't want it. Get our money back. So I go and look at some more stuff. And I don't know if Ashley was with us that time. And, 
And I come back, and I think it was her and Ashley, and they are now in the booth talking to that lady, buying more cream! <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. It was Ryan, you and Ryan, buying more cream. Ryan's like, oh, this would be good. I could exfoliate this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Lord. So, so the thing is, is that people that are very confident and believe in what they're doing, they're successful doing it. The problem is, how do we, how do we believe that when we have been victimized and we have been hurt and there is pain? Okay, so let's, let's just talk about that quickly. Wow, it's like time stood still. That's good. So in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 17, we'll start. It says, so, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their heart. Now, <laughs> when I say we need a better translation, it's because that sounds negative. That doesn't sound like an encouraging, positive thing. You just go, oh, yeah, hardened hearts, callous, excluded from God, right? It, it, but, but that's not what Paul's trying to write here. Paul's saying, I want to affirm and confirm in you that you don't need to walk any longer in the futility of your mind like the Gentiles do. What does the futility of the mind do? Is that you try to prepare yourself for bad things happen. That's futile because like Victoria was saying earlier, you can't control it. So preparing yourself for bad things happening, A, they may never happen. And if they do, it doesn't matter what you do. You can't be prepared for it, right? It's just going to happen, and what you experience when those things happen, you don't have the grace in this day to deal with what you're going to have to deal with three weeks from now. You don't have the grace. The grace is given to you in the moment that you need it. That is the goodness of God's grace. So there's no sense fretting about something you can't control that could happen in the future because you don't have the grace to deal with that, and if it does happen, you'll have the grace to deal with it and know that God's good that he is with you in hardship and in failure. And no matter what, he's working all things to your glory. He's working all things for your benefit, all things for your goodness. He's doing it as you come to him and say, Lord, this is a mess. I need you to, what can we do? And if you just trust him and you walk with him and you begin to worship him and just pray, then God will start to move those things in your benefit because he's going to teach you and he's going to train you. And this is how you look at the Christian life as, I had somebody years ago that left the church and they were angry with me and, and said, you know, your problem is you just don't think anything's a big deal. You don't care about anything. You, you, you know, you make changes. We're going to change from this building to that building or this service time to this service time. And, and, and then when you make a mistake and it falls apart, you just keep going like it's no big deal to you. I'm like, yeah, is that wrong? <laughs> is that, <laughs> it's taken me a lifetime to learn that. It's taken me a lifetime to learn it's not a big deal. And I'm like, that same not big deal grace is the grace that you receive from me pastoring you all the time. Because it's not a big deal. God just wants you to move forward instead of getting stuck going, well, I failed before. Yes. I love what Brene Brown uh, says at one of her TED Talks. She said, really, what TED Talks are, are is a conference for, for people who fail thousands of times and keep going, Right? People that keep making mistakes and keep failing. I mean, people that develop cures for diseases is that they, they have to fail at least a thousand times before they ever succeed. And you hear of the great stories of people that have succeeded in this world. It's, it's, it's been built on a giant mountain of failure a giant mountain of mistakes, a giant mountain. And so when you look at, when you back up and look at the whole picture, you go, were all those things a mistake? And I've told the story of President Lincoln, and, and I mean, he failed at every single thing he ever ran for. He ran in his high school, in his junior high school, didn't make it. Ran for counselor, didn't make it. Ran for mayor, didn't make it. Ran for senator, didn't make it. Failed, 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 and then became the president of the United States, and one of the best ever. But he, he had mastered failure, and, so, and perseverance, and the only thing left for him was to succeed. That was the only thing left. So the problem is when you base your story on I can't succeed because I have failed or I can't get free because I'm hurt or because I keep getting hurt, it's because you believe that it keeps you trapped. It's because you can't let that go. 
I was watching a, a video this morning on, and, they, and, and some of you know this, of how they, hunters used to capture monkeys as they would take coconuts and they would hollow them out and they'd put a little hole in it just enough so that monkey's hand could get in and then they would put some treat in there, like some kind of piece of fruit. So when the monkey reached in, it would grab it and then it couldn't get its hand out with the fruit in it. And the hunters would just walk up and put a bag over the head and take them because the monkeys would not let go. Even in imminent danger, they wouldn't let go. And we're like that in our minds. We become futile in our minds because there's some things that we just won't let go of. Now, how do you know what those things are in your life? And I don't think for most of us, you don't have to dig that deep. You just have to be willing to look. What do I just not let go? I think if you just spent five minutes kind of quiet, you know, with some ocean wave music in the background or something, <laughs> you would quickly know what those things are. You, you, these are some of the questions you need to ask yourself. What is the story I always tell? When I meet people for the first time, when I meet strangers and I'm getting to know them, what is the story I tell them about myself? What is what I communicate? Do I lead with, I, oh, I was really hurt here and hurt there and this person let me down? Do you, do you talk about that? So the question is, what are the things that you talk about? Or when you, when you meet people and you go, oh, this one time, this really bad thing happened to me and you find yourself continually telling that story, then that's a memory and you're like that monkey and you're stuck to it. That memory then of what happened to you is still affecting you and it doesn't need to because all it is to you is a memory. It happened in the past. It doesn't have to have any bearing on today because you've maybe learned from it or grown from it. But the problem is you get stuck back there. And some of those are traumatic. Some of those are bad things. Some of those are really horrible events or you've seen something tragic or experienced something tragic or there's some kind of abuse that's happened either physically or emotionally or sexually but that, that you're kind of holding on to that and then it, and, and so what happens is you kind of can never grow past it. And you, so you stretch yourself into the future trying to grow forward while you're still holding on to this memory because you find it come up all the time. I see this in, in my own life where I've been in situations and Victoria and I will now call each other on it for the betterment of each other. She'll go, honey, you know what? You tell that story all the time. And uh, we'll probably edit this out later, Rick, so you'll know this on the thing. Um, but when I was growing up, and I love my dad, and, and he grew up in a very different environment than I did, and he's been an amazing father, an amazing grandfather, but he, he grew up with a very strict disciplinary German father who never hugged him, never said he loved him, and beat him, you know. So he was used to that. Now, my dad never did that to us. He, he kissed us all the time and, and loves us and everything. But when I was three years old, I was uh, playing over on a big dirt hill, and I had my big wheel. My dad told us not to play on that dirt hill because it was an excavation site for a house, right? And boy, but that dirt hill was, you know, when you're three, you know, <laughs> and your buddies, and they got a flag at the top, and you're a boy, oh Lord, that is fun, right? Because you imagine all sorts of things. So, so I was on that dirt hill, right? And I'll never forget my dad coming over that dirt hill, and I'm looking up at him, and I just, you know, my life was flashing before my eyes, and he said, let's go, you know, and that's all he needed to say, and I got back on my big wheel, and he grabbed me by the back of the neck, and my legs were just going on that big wheel <laughs> as we were going home, and he got me in the garage, and he picked up a big two-by-four like this, and he said, and he was slapping it in his hand, and he said, I told you not to go in that dirt hill, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, my life is about to end, like, I can't believe he's going to beat me to death the two by four for the dirt hill. And I was three, and I remember that like it happened yesterday. See, I remember that event. Now, as an adult, we joke about it now because I know he was never going to hit me with that. He was trying to scare me. We, we talked about it recently. He goes, well, I was trying to scare you because I was terrified you'd be on that dirt hill and get buried with dirt. And I have for sure done similar things with my kids. Not with the two by four, but I've tried to scare them verbally. <laughs> you know what will happen if you do this? You will die, you know, and I've done that. <laughs> Everything ends in death is a joke in our home. 
if you don't put the cap on the blender, <laughs> the fruit could come flying out. You could slip on it and drive your hand through, chop your arm off and bleed to death before we'd know and you would die. You know? <laughs> so I've, this memory always comes back to me and it's a story I tell. I, I tell this story about this thing that happened to me. And so when I was praying through some other stuff in my life, I said, Lord, I don't seem to ever get past this. I have a constant fear that I'm going to be in trouble. And different things have happened, and, and they're raised, and I get all this anxiety and fear. And it's like, I'm going to be in trouble. And I'm like, I'm a 47-year-old man. I need to get over it. I need to pull my stuff together. Like, what's my problem? I'm not going to be in trouble. I could just like, I could beat that guy to a pulp. Why am I worried about it? He's just a skinny little scrawny, you know, and you start yeah. rationalizing it. <laughs> now, I'm not going to fight that guy, but, but you're trying to make yourself feel better of why am I, why am I afraid? It's, it's completely illogical why I'm afraid about something I shouldn't really be afraid about. And, and there's just this gripping fear of being in trouble or being afraid. I'm like, Lord, why? So the Lord told me, took me back to the story. He goes, because of this. Because he says, as an adult, you know now that that wasn't going to happen. But that three-year-old little boy didn't know that. And so the fact that you know it here in time doesn't affect this because he still had to live through his life till he is now you with this fear in his life. And I remember what happened that I would remember when my dad would come home, we'd be home after school watching TV and I'd hear the door open, I'd hear his voice and I'd, I'd feel this pang. You guys get pangs yeah. of anxiety? You right about here and here? Yeah. Usually not here, that'd be weird. <laughs> we'll pray for you if you get it there, but it's usually here, <laughs> right? We get these pangs of anxiety. And I remember having that all the time. I'd hear his voice and get this pang. And he was never abusive to us, but there was just that fear of being in trouble, right? So the Lord took me back to that event and said, you need to be healed because if we can heal this boy and we can change this memory, then it erases it as if it didn't happen or it recontextualizes it so that then going through your life to where you are now, it's almost like time travel. It's almost like the Lord, because God's spirit is timeless, right? And he can be alive in any one given moment in your life. So he can take you back to that moment. So I said, okay, Lord, uh, how do we do this? I don't know how to do that. He's like, well, just invite me. Invite me into that memory. Invite me into that space and say, Lord, where were you when that happened? When that event happened, I need to see where you are. Just stand up for a sec, Jess. So I was, I was here, and I said, Lord, I need to see you in this picture. And I saw the Lord stand in this picture and just put his hand out on my dad's chest. Just go, peace and grace. No fear. And he said, it's okay, I got it. You're okay. You're safe. It's not going to happen. You're safe. And in that moment, this kid, I felt what that emotion felt like. Because it's like I was back there. And all of a sudden, that fear went away. That fear was gone because I knew Jesus was there. I knew Jesus was there resisting that from happening. Okay, you can sit down. So then going forward, it was like it undid. And I saw a pattern over the next weeks that followed and months that followed that stuff that would cause pangs didn't cause pangs anymore. It's like I didn't have that knee-jerk response anymore because that memory was healed. Now, the obvious question you should be asking, because some of you go, oh yeah, well that's nice for you, but my dad actually did hit me with a two by four. That abuse actually did happen. So where's Jesus there? How, how do you invite Jesus into abuse that did happen? And I don't know how the Lord will show you, but you still ask him and you invite him and maybe he will speak something to you. I'll give, give you another story. I think I might've shared this last week. So, what? <laughs> All right, two weeks ago. So, <laughs> thanks, thanks. That's awesome. <laughs> Always sit in the front, honey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, it, it, back, same thing. Now I'm, I'm like two years old, and I remember this. I used to always have nightmares. My parents would go, we lived in a creepy house for some reason. And my parents said it was, it was bad. They had some of the worst fights they ever had in that house. 
And I remember standing in my crib, like vividly, screaming and screaming and screaming and begging my parents not to leave because I knew I would have this nightmare. So I remember the one night they laid me in the double bed because there was a, a crib there and, and a double bed. So they put me in, or, well, yeah, in their bed because I would sleep at the end of the bed. And I would have this dream, and it happened more than once. And as I was laying in bed, I would see this like army march in like Planet of the Apes, like big black gorilla looking things with weapons and bullets. And they marched right through the room and beside my bed. And I'd be terrified, right? I'm two. And I remember it again like it was yesterday. And then I would hide myself and then I would look, I'd roll over and try to sleep. And then I would see a hand come up on the side of the bed that was dark and try to grab at my face. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And I, I've told the story a thousand times to people. And I was praying one day and saying, Lord, I, I just seem to struggle like with, with a feeling of rejection all the time. It's like I have this knee-jerk reaction when stuff happens. I feel people are rejecting me and I, I want to lash out. I get really upset. And I don't know where the root of that is. Where, does, where is the root of that coming from? Where, where is that damage coming from? And so the Lord took me back to that moment and he said, right there. I said, well, how's that rejection? He said, because you knew, and I, I said, because I feel like nobody cares about me. Nobody cares about me. No matter what I'm going through, nobody cares. And so I always need to up the ante, like I'm really suffering, like it's really bad. And I used to have thoughts like this, so I'm being really open with you guys. I used to have thoughts like this. Well, I hope I get really sick one day. I hope I get some like disease that's going to kill me and then people will feel sorry for me. People go, wow, he's really suffered for the Lord. Look at the abuse he's gone through. Now he's even got cancer. And I, and I said to the Lord, I know that's super wrong because I don't want cancer and I, I actually enjoy living. But, but I, I feel like nobody cares and I don't know how to make people care. So how do I, how do I fix that? And he goes, and it started here. Because no matter how much you cried, you believed at two years old, your parents didn't care. They were going to go out and have a good time. And it didn't matter how terrified you were, they were going to leave you. Now, they didn't know. They weren't even Christians. They, didn't, they had no idea. They just knew I was having night terrors and that was it. And so they left. So I said, so in this case, that kind of abuse was happening. There was, so I said, well, Lord, how do, how do we fix that? Because it's a memory. It's not real. There's not really things rocking through my room, or maybe spiritually there was, I don't know, close to a spiritual demonic stronghold. I don't know, but probably not. But I was terrified. So I said, Lord, how do we fix it? I need a picture of you. Now again, I want you to remember that the Lord's dealing with a two-year-old. So all of a sudden I said, Jesus, will you come and visit that memory in my past and be with me? And I need to see you. I need to have a vision of you, of what you were doing, and, 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 and how do you fix that? I don't know. And so all of a sudden I have this picture that I'm sitting in the bed and Jesus is sitting next to me in bed. And he's got a big bag of popcorn and he's eating popcorn. And, and he's like, you have some popcorn. And these things are marching through the room and he's eating popcorn. So he's communicating to me, it's like a movie, right? And I'm like, oh, I don't need to be afraid. Jesus is watching this like it's a movie. And then he looks at me and he starts going, And I started laughing, and I was doing it too. I was like, pew, pew, shooting these things, right? And then they were, it's like they were surprised. And he's like, it's okay, we're okay. They have, they have no authority over you. You'll learn that one day. You see, it's okay. And then, and then I saw that hand come up, and Jesus reached over and high-fived it. And we both burst out laughing. And it was like, this is no big deal. You're not really in danger. It's just a memory. Now, to that little boy, it really happened. And as an adult, I know it's no big deal, but that little boy didn't know it was no big deal. And all of a sudden, healing was birthed there. Now, it takes time because I'm 47. That kid was two. That doesn't happen overnight. But as the days and months are going now, or, well, it's only been weeks, but as weeks have been going from that time when the Lord showed me, I feel the healing coming. Mm -hmm. Victoria said to me just uh, last week, she goes, it's weird. I'm watching you respond to things. Because what would happen in our marriage, I'm almost done for this week, what would happen in our, our marriage so often is uh, just simple things like 
I, I would blend uh, something in the a blender every morning and then the thing wouldn't be there and I'm having to root for it and look for it. And I'd be frustrated. I'm like, this is where it goes. Why can't it be there? Why do I have to look for it all the time? And I'm like, you know, I'm not hiding your coffee scoop everywhere, so you have to look for it in the morning. That would be frustrating for you, right? Because for me, and then for me, it would just escalate, you know? We would have a fight, and, and I would just leave the house upset, going, that's it! I can't handle this anymore! And, and I'm having visions of family court and children going in opposite directions over a blender, Right? And and I know while it's happening, it's completely irrational. It's not rational. It's not a normal response to having to look for your blender pieces. And I know it, but it doesn't help, right? It doesn't help that I know it in my head. I can't control that emotionally I'm feeling she doesn't care about me. She doesn't care. She doesn't care. I have to care. That's my responsibility as a husband. I've got to care about a whole bunch of stuff, but she can't care about me. Can't even just screw it on, put it back. She doesn't care. Yeah. And, and, and so it would escalate for me, and it would be very upsetting, and then very hard to get over. So the only way we would fix that when we had those discussions is she'd have to call me and say, honey, I love you. Let's not fight. I'm sorry. And then I'd go, oh, okay, she cares. And it would just deflate like a balloon, and I'd be okay. But it was a pain for her because the only way we would reconcile, she'd had to apologize to me for being irrational yeah that's why we're still married for 19 years she's just had to say sorry lots even when it was my fault right so when the lord started to deal with this with me i i remember it was a few weeks ago i open up the thing and the the blender thing is not there again <laughs> and we've already had a talk about it more than once. I don't expect dinner on the table every night, but I'd like my blender. <laughs> and I can feel myself, you know, normally I'd get mad, and I'm looking at the blender, and I'm thinking, she doesn't care. And then for the first time, another voice happened. Nah, no, nah, that's not true. She cares. She got busy. Maybe the kids put it away. Maybe it wasn't her at all. It was for sure Jesse. <laughs> you know what? She's got a lot of things on her mind. This has nothing to do with me. It's a blender. I gotta let it go. It doesn't matter. I'll find it. And I found it. And I blended it. And, I, and then I, I kind of like drinking my coffee going, oh my God, what just happened? I didn't freak out. I didn't get really hurt over something stupid. I didn't, it didn't ruin my day. It didn't take me hours to work through. It's like it was gone because this memory is like it didn't exist. And as time goes on, there'll be more and more distance and more healing because it's like the Lord goes back in that time and plants a seed of care or concern or I care about you or I'm concerned about you or I'm with you. You don't have to worry. I'm with you now and to the ends of the earth. So this is what Paul's talking about. Don't be like the Gentiles that get stuck in the futility of your mind trying to sort all these things out, try, trying to be like Jesus trying so hard, going, okay, I know it's not like Jesus to get really upset with your blender, so ah, and quote scripture at yourself. Yeah, right? This, this is what we've all done. Or you start trying to sing a song. Blessed be the name of the Lord, freaking blender. Blessed be the name. You know, it doesn't work. You know, if you're spirit-filled, you're like, and you try to pray in tongues around it. And I've done all of those things, and they don't work. They don't work for that because it doesn't bring healing to that situation. Now, you can pray in the Spirit for a long time, and the Lord can show you that that's what's going on as your Spirit communes with Him. But we all have that stuff, right? And it might seem innocuous to you. It might seem like no big deal. But if you find that it's always coming up in your mind, if it's always part of your story, if it's a story you tell, if it's something you think of often, I'm telling you that that wound is open and that memory is affecting you. You might even not know how it's affecting you, but it's open. And the Lord wants you to invite him into that space so that he can close out that wound. And then it can become healed. And then a scar forms so that you know that event happened. But we know what's interesting. You'll remember it differently. 
Because now when I think back to that story, you know what? Jesus has so infiltrated that memory that I only now see Jesus eating popcorn. I don't even see the monsters. I think of them as shooting targets now and Jesus high-fiving the scary monster hand in my dream. That's what I think of now. When I think about my dad in the garage with the two by four, I don't think of my dad being mean anymore. I think Jesus standing there with his hand on my dad's chest trying to bring peace to him because he's afraid of me. And then all are afraid that I'm going to get hurt. So in that moment, that memory becomes healed instead of open and affecting me. Do you see that? Anyways, there's lots more scripture I wanted to go into, but I'll leave you with this one. The Bible says that we are to renew our minds. That part of walking in the Spirit is not walking in the futility, but renewing our minds in the Spirit. And so the way you do that as you walk in the Spirit, the Spirit of God can come into those different places and make your mind brand new again so that you think differently about things. And you imagine if you could go through your life and invite Jesus into every area that had caused you pain and brokenness and hurt and scarring, who would you be? What would you be capable of? What would hinder you? You could start to say, if Christ be for me, who could be against me? That if he is truly a friend that walks closer, brother, that he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. That doesn't just mean from today forward. That means that when you come to the knowledge of Jesus today, that means he never left you. You can invite him back into your past where you didn't even know him, but you know him now because he was always with you. Jesus was always with you before you knew him, before you rendered your heart to him, before you accepted him, before you accepted just the truth that he had already saved you. He was already with you before that even happened. So all you need to do is have a revelation of who Jesus is and where he is in your life. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord, I pray that in the weeks and months that, that come, pray that you would just continue as we come into your presence and we come into worship, Lord, that you'd begin to stir those things in our heart. You say, this is a story you're always telling yourself, and it's not true. This is something you've believed about yourself. This is, you see how you're reacting here? You see how you're angry here? You see how you're upset here? You see how you're defensive here? There's a reason for that. Let's bring some healing. Let's bring some restoration. Let's, let's reconcile that so that that doesn't affect you negatively anymore because I want to bring peace and grace into your life. Lord, I pray that you'd start to stir those things in each one of us and bring it to our conscious minds so we start to think about it and invite you into that. And, you, and Lord, that you would just bring forth stories uh, that we start telling a new story. Hey, I used to be like this and now I'm like this. Why? Because of Jesus. Because Jesus brought healing. Jesus brought comfort. Jesus brought wholeness. And Lord, that's how we truly become witnesses of you. We witness the power of your transformation in our lives with no effort. It takes no effort for us to have our memories changed. And Lord, I just ask that by your spirit, you'd come in and start to bring healing into memories and thoughts that are causing all of us damage and all of us struggle and all of us pain and not allowing us to go forward, but being like monkeys stuck holding on to stuff that you're saying, just let go. I've got something so much better for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Let's have a great week.